my relationship with my dad, you know, we, we, there was no discipline. I just, I just missed that father-son relationship where most kids have with their dad. I never met him as my father per se. I was introduced to him um, when I was 21 years old and people were telling me that he was my dad and when I asked him, he denied it. So I remember growing up and I clung to the streets because that's all I had and the streets were my father. My father would beat on my mom uh, regularly. They would have people over the house partying, drinking, listening to music, uh, and they left me and my brother just let us be by ourselves. I didn't understand what care and compassion. Uh, I hadn't been taught any of those things. I hadn't witnessed any of those things. So I was unfamiliar with how I should feel. So I just felt numb, like, okay, so what? She dead, she dead, he dead, he dead. Man, I miss my father and I want him to be here with me, but he's not. And it was just this emptiness of him not being there. And then in some weird way, you know, in a 15 year old person's mind, I just thought if I became him, be, I mean, literally became him, then I would feel like he's with me. Like I would kind of be him and it make me feel close to him. So I remember I would start dressing like he dressed, acted how he acted. I started using drugs and alcohol. Uh, and I just really didn't even care about anybody, including myself. I wanted a father to, to be able to discipline me and say, look, this is the wrong way to go. I wanted, I desired to have a father who, 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 who would tell me, that what I did was wrong. A real father shows their son that a, a, a husband and a father, a male, uses their strength to protect, not to intimidate. They use their strength to guard and to provide rather than to uh, steal or uh, criminalize. Uh, real men uh, are the roadmap that are absolutely essential for boys to follow. I used to be out a lot into the streets, you know, just out there playing a lot. And uh, so I was never really uh, the, the, a child that set up under my parents because my parents were always working. My dad became a heavy drinker. And, and then he, was, he would get so drunk to where his face, he, he would fall asleep in his plate of food. His face would be actually in the plate of food. Now the only time that he interacted with me was when he was drunk, he would set me on his lap and he'd rub my head and tell me, Daddy love you, that was it. It wasn't like, you know, stay out of trouble and what have you been doing, have you been doing good in school? I was outside one day and, and uh, it was my first time ever 
doing something that I knew was really wrong. So this milk truck was delivering milk uh, one day, and uh, I decided I decided to uh, go into the milk truck and look in the cab of the milk truck for something to take. And I looked and I looked up under the seat of this milk truck and there was a, it was a paper bag. And so I took the paper bag and grabbed it real quick and I ran. And when I opened the bag up, amazingly, there was a gun in the bag. When I took this gun to my father, my father looked at the gun, he said, where'd you get it from? I told him I found it. I found the gun. It had bullets in the bag as well. So I said, I found this. He, he said, oh, okay. And he looked at the gun and then he says, uh, where'd you find it? I said, oh, it was out, outside in the yard, you know, in, one, in the yard across the street. My father took the gun. He said, well, okay, I'm going to take the gun. I, I don't worry about the gun no more. That's all he said. Don't worry about the gun no more. But you be careful out there. Don't be doing it wrong. So from that point on, I figured the stealing was easy. It was an easy thing to steal. So I started stealing and stealing out of stores and stealing cakes and pies. My mother was white, my father was black. So definitely looking different than other people uh, made me stand out and that didn't turn out to be a good thing because a lot of kids picked on me a lot. You know, they made fun of me, they would make fun of my mother when they would come around. And I didn't like that, so I get into a lot of disputes, which turned into fights, which mostly resulted in me getting beat up a lot. I really loved my father because he really had a lot of respect. I looked up to him. However, he was a very mean and stern person. Uh, he didn't play um, with anyone. And people would always say, you know, Lewis, he wasn't no joke, because I'm a junior. And, uh, you know, he would be very mean to my mother, uh, mostly physical abuse, although some uh, verbal abuse. Um, and that's, that translated into us, you know, myself with being uh, verbally abusive, physically abusive. And so I was afraid of him. So I tried to like be good and not do bad. Uh, at 15 years old, he was murdered in a drug deal gone wrong. I knew that he was into stuff that was bad, but I didn't know really the magnitude of which he was involved in those things until that incident actually took place. And man, it just, it kind of came out of nowhere. You know, I came home from school one day, my mother was crying. I asked her, you know, what had happened and she told me and that just, it just devastated me. I remember running to my bed room and jumping into bed crying and I just remember saying, God, I hate you. And I don't really know where that came from. I never went to church. I don't even know if I even really believed in God or something. I just had this hurt and this anger inside me and I guess I kind of felt that um, I needed to find somebody to be mad. At. My mom was an alcoholic and a drug user, and my father as well. Uh, my father would beat on my mom uh, regularly. They would have people over the house partying, drinking, listening to music. My mom passed away in my early teens, maybe like 12 or 13. She, uh, my dad died first from kidney and liver failure due to substance abuse. They was addicts. They shot. I just felt numb, like, okay, so what? She dead, she dead, he dead, he dead. They wasn't doing anything for me anyway. So I started just hanging out in the streets, stealing candy, uh, doing things that I knew I shouldn't do because I wanted what everybody else had. I was born um, in Chicago, Illinois, um, single mother, um, never knew my dad, pretty much, um, it was an affair that they hid and they never wanted me, well, them to know about it. We pretty much had to uh, look for the streets as our fun and games and entertainment. And my mom was in two abusive relationships, so that had its toll. And I clung to the streets because that's all I had. And the streets were my father. I um, remember, like I said, cutting school when I was a kid. My dad was an alcoholic. Um, but he was a loving dad. He, he was there, but he wasn't there. There was no discipline. There really was no accountability, you know. I mean, I started off, you know, smoking marijuana in high school. And then um, also, you know, maybe, you know, drinking a little beer here and there. 
and it just pretty much escalated. I mean, again, I had never really gotten out there too bad during high school. My dad passed away back in, in 1985. I had just graduated out of high school and I was in my first year in college. Without an available uh, father or male figure in a boy's life, particularly for young men, they are much more likely to get involved early on in uh, delinquent behavior, disruptive antisocial behavior at school uh, that escalates into minor criminal activity, drinking, use of drugs, and um, the gangs are, are well aware of this phenomenon. They look, they have people who specifically are looking for eight or nine year old boys who are uh, lonely, angry, who have no father figure in their lives. And in the neighborhood, they had these gangs. And they were, they were going around recruiting guys in the gang at that time. And so I can remember where they used to always chase me to try to get, you know, recruit me. And a couple of times they jumped on me, you know, they beat me up. One day, I just decided I was tired of getting beat up. And so I went to the gang and I told them, I said, man, I want to join. And I, I joined this little gang at the time. The gang was like a family. It became like a, it, it, uh, an intimacy. Uh, we would talk, we would, we would do things together, we would eat together, we'd go, we'd go steal food and we'd eat it together. We would do anything. So it was more like they, they, they were my brothers. They became a family of brothers. 80% of people behind bars come from urban areas and therefore, they have no fathers, but the gang become their family. We call that a pseudo family. What attracted me to the gang was actually just the unity. We all had something in common. A lot of us were miserable. We had uh, no fathers in our lives. And so it's like a pack of dogs, you know, they, we, we hung together and we clung together. Pretty much uh, just it, life spiraled real fast. Once I got in a gang, it turned into uh, stealing cars at 15 and uh, juvenile for getting caught, going to juvenile detention. I remember I would be driving with my buddies and we would see someone's car and we'd say, hey, that's so-and-so's car from this neighborhood and it's someone we don't like. And we would already know, okay, his car's parked here. Tomorrow or tonight in the late night, we're gonna burn his car. And um, we would burn cars, break windows, um, even to the point where sometimes we would go and go to other neighborhoods and jump out on people and jump them and act like we were a different gang just because, we, for the thrill of it, because we wanted to instill damage. My alliance was no longer with my family, but my alliance, uh, my loyalty was for the gang. After I'm with this gang and after, you know, I'm following along doing uh, what I was asked to do and required to do in certain situations. I got shot in the leg, you know, and then the second time I got shot in the back, which was very serious than the first time because I had to go to the hospital. I had to have surgery and stuff like that. Every human being has six basic needs. Number one, we have the need to belong. The need to be accepted. The need for love and to be loved. The need for truth. Don't lie to me, tell me that. Truth, the need for forgiveness, and the need for justice. And if these men don't belong in a family, they're not, are not accepted in a family, they're going to function in the pseudo-family of a gang. And therefore, they have to survive. And the gangs is about what? Territory. It's about survival. It's about drugs. It's about making money. It's about living the life. My auntie called me. I was in the hospital. She said, you're gonna die. She cried on the phone. I could hear her, she cried. She said, I promise to my sister that I will take care of you. Please come give me a chance. Please let me keep my promise to my sister. So I went. I got my GED. Uh, 
I started going to college. I started doing good. Before you know it, I started missing my street life. I started wanting and craving the power and the, and the women and the money. I remember getting into a shootout with somebody, getting away, telling a friend of mine about it. And um, after I spoke to him about it, shortly afterwards, they came back and I got shot, the other gangs. And I got shot in the hand and in the leg. And I did some, about a month or two in the hospital recovering. And during that time, the war was still going on. Pretty much it started because I got shot. And um, my buddy got killed. So that took its toll on me too. You know, he's a friend of mine who, he, his dad passed away and got killed. So he grew up without a father. And so I was bringing him up into the gangs and next thing you know, he's dead. So I felt that was my responsibility. And I wanted to take, I wanted revenge. Before you know it, all the money was gone. And I owed these guys a couple thousand back in Iowa. And I didn't have nowhere to go. I'm walking up and down the street. I'm hungry, I'm tired. I'm feeling so miserable, and uh, somebody told me, you can go to Pacific Guard Mission, they'll let you sleep, they'll feed you. One day, I was in the day room, and i never forget it, uh, four men came in there from the Bible program. And they were so happy, they had so much peace, they had so much joy. They had something and, and I wanted it. First I thought it was drugs. And they did a service about restoration, about God's love and how he'll accept you if you just ask for forgiveness. So I enlisted into the U.S. Army and I uh, did basic training. And while I was in basic training, uh, my high school sweetheart um, and I decided that we would get married when I get out. And once I finished basic training and came back home, um, we decided to get married that following summer. And we were doing very well, very well, uh, living on the north side of Chicago, that I decided that I would, you know, kind of go back over on the west side start hanging back over in the project, slowly but surely. Um, start hanging with some of the guys that <laughs> shouldn't have been hanging with, that was out there kind of doing some, some things that they shouldn't have been doing um, in terms of drugs. In the streets, I had gotten involved in a relationship. There was some infidelity. I got involved in a relationship where um, I ended up having a child. By, by another woman. One day I tried heroin, and when I, when I first uh, tried it, and you sniff it, you know, some people sniff it, some people shoot it, but I sniffed it and I could remember it kind of like burned my nostrils, and I'm like, oh my gosh. As I continued to go over and hang out and hang out and hang out, one thing led to another where I started using it again. And then eventually it got to a point where I had used it so much where I had developed a habit and I became addicted. After my father got killed and I tried to pick up the pieces of my life, uh, things didn't go well. I went from being a person who was pretty good and really didn't get in a whole lot of trouble to being a person that didn't care anymore. Uh, and so I became a drug dealer. You know, I had started selling marijuana in school, using marijuana in school. Uh, I got to the point to where I couldn't buy all the things I wanted to buy with selling marijuana because I was smoking it all up. So I kind of graduated to selling crack cocaine. And so I was making thousands of dollars selling crack. I was able to buy, you know, big gold chains, cars, uh, all the clothes I wanted. I could go to the clubs and have fun and just do all those kind of things. And, uh, you know, it just kind of spiraled out of control into a lot of violence taking place with me doing drive-by shootings. At 24, I became a Chicago police officer. So I served the police department for about 20, well, 20 years, 20 years. And uh, during that time, I was a bivocational pastor. You know, these kids are, are trying to find acceptance in gangs and uh, they're making easy money selling drugs and that's the, that's the appeal. 
and uh, you know they're being raised by a single mother sometimes as, as, as grandma because mom is a is a, a teenage uh, a teenage mother they're out there on the street to have a gun it's it, it's, it's cool to be in a shooting is cool to be chased by the police is cool they don't really have a lot of respect for authority. They don't have a lot of respect for life. You know, where does that come from? I believe that comes from an absence of values that are instilled in the home. And the best way that they're, they're, they're instilled is in a two-parent home. And, and seeing that dynamic, having a father, a, an authoritative figure in the, in the home that's guiding them, that's showing them how to be a man, how to respect authority. My first adult incarceration uh, began at the age of, uh, I, was, I was going to the age of 17. I was about 16 and a half, and I had committed a crime, uh, I believe at that time was an was a, was a armed robbery uh, with an with a older gentleman. Statesville Penitentiary. Now, Statesville Penitentiary was a place if you went you had to really, and we call this, if you don't mind me using this term, you had to really gun up. Gun up means this here. You had to get your gloves together, put on gloves, get you some gloves. You have to get you a couple of knives, and you have to stand in that prison. You have to be a man. You have to stand. You have to uh, fight for your life. You have to defend your life. Because down there in Statesville Penitentiary, it was not controlled by the officers who were in charge to guard it was controlled by the inmates i looked at prison as a notch in my belt so to speak you know in the world i lived in um there would be accolades or kind of uh credibility that you could get from street you know people and so that was kind of a notch i didn't have you know got into fights got into shootouts all that kind of stuff but i had never been to prison and so in some weird sense it was like hey I need to go there because that could be one of the maybe final notches that would be in my belt. There was still a part of me that wanted to do right, that wanted to have nice things and be somebody in life that wasn't a drug dealer or a criminal. And so actually during uh, high school, uh, I went and moved uh, out of state with an uncle with the um, idea that he would help me figure out what I was going to do in life and uh, didn't turn out that way. And I ended up getting involved with the same type of people that I was um, with and where I was from. So I ended up coming back and that was, that was kind of like my chance of saying, hey, let me see if I can go straight and do the right thing. But nothing panned out and so I got back home and then I went on just a super crime spree. Um, my vehicle was, was pretty much uh, implicated in, in a robbery. And, um, and so that's how I ended up in the county jail, um, faced with six to 30 years for the offense of armed robbery. And so um, after fighting the case for almost a year, I decided to, um, as we say, cop out for the, uh, the, um, the three years probation. And so I took the three year probation and I can remember this particular day uh, my wife was there in court with me, um, so we leave the courtroom and we, we, we leave the Cook County Jail, we, we get on the bus, we drive, we ride to the train station, we get on the train. I was supposed to ride up north with her at this time, she had moved back in with her mom, and I remember coming to a stop, Western, that's the stop that I used to, <laughs> that's where I used to hang out over on Western. And so I remember coming to the stop at Weston and I just stood up and I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I'll, I'll call you a little later. And she looked at me like, are you serious? And so I got off the train and I went right back over to the projects. And it was a week later that I ended up um, hanging with some more guys and um, driving a vehicle, we had went out to 
you know, try to get some money to support our habit. And it was there that I ended up getting caught up in another robbery. It was a high-speed chase. Um, and I, I thought I had gotten away, had the police <laughs> behind me and, and really thought I had gotten away. But I was driving the car, stopped the car, got out of the car, the car was still going and I think it ran into a fence and all this stuff. And I re re remember going into a store and while I was in the store, I can hear sirens, I can hear everything. And, every, and, and all of a sudden everything died down. So I stood in the store, I stayed in the store, I would say, excuse me, for about, I don't know, three or four minutes. And all of a sudden, something told me to walk outside. And in my mind, now as I look back, and I've always said this, that, that at that particular time, I feel that that was God. I feel that that was the presence of God, the, the sovereignty of God saying, that's it, enough is enough. And so I went down to the station, um, got in the lineup, this guy pointed me right out, and there I go, headed to the county jail. I wanted revenge. So I got out of the hospital and, and you know, when I got shot, I got shot because I ran out of bullets. So I didn't want that to happen no more. And I remember um, saying, well, I'm gonna buy two guns and you know, I'll keep one on me. And, and when I'm walking with somebody, I let them hold the other one just to be safe. And as I was healing and recuperating and you know, I couldn't run, I was still walking with a cane. Um, I ran into one of the guys who was involved in my shooting. I shot him five times and um, shortly afterwards they pronounced him dead at the hospital and um, the cops were looking for me. And it's funny because um, he was his only witness but what happened was the cops actually grabbed one of the guys from my neighborhood and um, instead of being a stand-up guy he actually uh, ratted me out. And so once I knew how the, the cops were looking for me, yeah, it was over with for me. I had to leave the neighborhood. and. You know, Chicago wasn't an option no more. So I fled and I ended up from, you know, to Ohio, to Florida, Puerto Rico, Ohio, back to Florida for about, about 11 months I was a fugitive. Chicago right now has the reputation of, of violence. We, we are one of the most violent cities in the country. And a lot of the violence, a lot of the, a lot of the shootings are, are happening uh, in, in neighborhoods. Uh, uh, from what I understand, a neighborhood where, where there's a lot of fatherlessness. I believe that, that these kids in these troubled, troubled na neighborhoods, I believe some of them are crying out. And, and what they're crying out is for attention. They're crying out for acceptance. I had a, a child on the way from a previous uh, relationship, and so this will be my first, my firstborn. It was my son. And I'll tell you, that was crazy because I grew up without a father, and knowing who my real father was, I found out he grew up without a father, and now I'm going to have a son who's going to grow up without a father. And I didn't want that to happen, so that's pretty much how I ended up getting caught because I tried to keep a relationship with him um, on the run for murder. I got flown over to Chicago, I ended up in the Cook County Jail, and that's a pretty, that's another chapter in my life that was like, that was the worst chapter in my life. I was sent back to prison and I, I pleaded guilty to a lesser charge and I believe I received for that charge like seven years, uh, if I'm correct, seven years. I went to prison after that, done I think about three and a half, uh, almost four years on the seven years. When I, when I went down on that charge, I went to Pontiac prison. And Pontiac was another, it was a very notorious prison. They call it the Thunderdome. It was a prison where lots of murders took place and everything. 
At 19 years old, I found myself in a courtroom uh, being convicted after three days of trial for attempted murder and first degree armed robbery and sentenced life in 100 years. I remember when that happened, they came and slapped the cuffs on, took me out into the hallway, and um, they put me at a desk and I sat down and I remember sitting down and just crying, like crying harder than I had in quite a while. And uh, the fulfillment that I thought I would find in becoming like my father and doing the things that I saw he do and the things I suspected he did, it didn't fulfill anything. While I was thinking that way, I just started contemplating suicide. I mean, I really felt um, 19 years old. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. I want to do the right thing. I want to pick back up where I left off, where I wanted to be an attorney and have a good life and people to like me and me to do good things and all, all those things that I was taught. I wanted to be that person, but I felt like it was too late. It was all gone. I had basically threw my life away and because of that, I just wanted to blow my brains out. And prison is not fun. Prison, you have to watch, you gotta make sure ain't nobody wanting to stab you. You gotta make sure nobody try to rape you. You gotta make sure you got something to eat. I would say the county on to prison after they found me guilty. It's a dark, dark life because you know you got murderers, rapists, drug dealers, drug users, abusers. Imagine in prison where you're around killers. You're around robbers, you're around muggers. You're around all the people <laughs> that you don't want to be around. Guys were getting stabbed uh, multiple times on the yard. And when we go out to recreation, uh, guys were getting stabbed, thrown off of four tier galleries, a uh, hit would just bust wide open. And it was terrible. I would always speak these curses, like, if I ever see this one person, I'm going to try to kill him. I'm going to try to do this and that. And one of them was the guy that actually killed a friend of mine. So I had favor in the prison, so I wanted this guy. And we got into a big fight, just me and him. And it got really bad where we ended up going to uh, segregation, which is like a prison in the prison. He actually witnessed to me, believe it or not. He actually shared the word with me. The county jail was rough. People will literally cop out just to go to, to prison because the county was just that bad. A lot of people don't understand the, the, the magnitude of how prison is. It's, it's the freedom, man. It's the, it's the freedom. Um, and that's what, that's what really hurt me the most, that I, that I lost my freedom. And so I tell people to this day, I don't look at it as a time where I was arrested. I said, I was rescued that day. It wasn't until I went to prison, um, after being there again for a few years, decided that, hey, you know what? Enough is enough. Something within me saying that, man, you need to, you need, you got a year to go. You did three years in prison, you got a year to go. You can't get back and, and, and go back to the same place. Well, there was a void in my life, and then I figured it out. I realized it. It was Jesus. I was missing God in my life. So I remember making a prayer in segregation. I just asked God to go with me and to you know, watch over me and to surround me with believers. And you know, I wanted to totally change my life. I just wanted to turn away from who I was and um, become something new. And so that started the next 10 years, the, which were the best 10 years of my life. I opened up this little Bible track that this guy gave me. And I remember it started talking about creation. You know, it said God created the heavens and the earth. And 
I had never really thought about who created the heavens and the earth. I had never really thought about was there a God and if so, who was he? And then it started talking about salvation. It said that everybody can be saved. That God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever would put their faith and trust in him, they would not die eternally, but they would have eternal life. And I thought, man, you know, I want this eternal life. There was a sinner's prayer. I prayed that prayer and I ended up praying my own prayer, which kind of went like this. God, I don't even know if you're real for real, but if you are, if all this stuff that I've read is real, I'm going to put all my faith and trust in you. But the minute that you show me uh, you're not real, I'm through messing with you. And so this was the first day of me being convicted. Um, in Clayton County Jail with life in a hundred years, my first day in jail, I decided to give my life to Christ. The year 1989, I can remember was a time when, when I was in Pontiac prison. And, and it seems more that God was showing me so much mercy and grace because all of the guys who came up with me, uh, most of them were dying away. They were either getting killed or you know, found dead somewhere. But here I am still living. One day I was sitting in my cell, I never would forget, it was a guy uh, in, 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 in prison who had a natural life sentence, he never was gonna get parole. He used to always come to my cell and talk to me. He wanted me to come to the church and support him. He said, if you come, you'll be glad you did. I went to that church and there was a guy giving a testimony. He had just got delivered from gangs and he was a notorious Spanish gang leader. He said he used to be the leader of the Latin kings. Now he served the king of kings. And this guy was talking so powerfully, so confident, so uh, radical about his change. It fired me up in the inside. It made me question, say, man, if God can change him, he can change you. After 15 and a half years in prison, God really shaped, molded, and directed my life. I ended up getting two more life sentences for a prior robbery that I had committed before the crime I actually went to prison for, which then that gave me three life sentences in 100 years. And I was just like, man, you know, this is it. Like, I'm gonna be here in prison forever. And I asked God to help me be content. <laughs> to ask God to say, hey, will you please let me be okay with spending the rest of my life in prison knowing that my life as I once knew it was over, but that there was a new life that you had for me in eternity that I could spend with him. And so he answered that prayer. He, he totally made me content with being where I was at. So I continued doing the Bible courses. After a number of years of doing them, I became a worker for Set Free Ministries, which meant I got an opportunity to actually respond to other people's answers that they did for their Bible studies. Then I started really growing even more in the knowledge of God's Word. And then I got up enough courage to actually start leading Bible studies with other people in prison where I was. And then also just going out on the prison yard and just talking to people that I never had saw before and try to have conversations with them about Christ. And so it was then when I really felt that I found God's purpose in my life. I sprung up on my feet before they were finished with the altar call. Running with my hands in the air saying, I'm, I'm ready, I'm tired. I'm tired of it. I'm tired. That's all I can remember says. I'm tired. I'm ready. Me. And the guy was like, he wasn't even done with the altar call. And from that day forward, that's when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. People from outside of the prison would come in and, and freely spend time, voluntarily by the way, and share fellowship with us, share the word with us. I was raised with bitterness and, and rage and anger. And God was showing me the root of it. And God reminded me that if you want to be truly forgiven, and I've done some things, I was in jail for murder, that if you really want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. And so that's when I was saying, okay, Lord, I release that unto you. Show me how to forgive. And so no longer am I mad at um, the abusive men in my mother's life or my mom for the way she raised me, even though times were tough.
wife and I, we ended up um, divorcing. Uh, this was at a time where, uh, at that particular time, I had uh, uh, been introduced to Manny, the corner near house. I had six months to go uh, before I was released from prison. He wrote to me about six months before he's released, but the house was full. And Barbara said, we're just gonna take him. But I said, Barbara, I feel something special about this guy. I said, uh, I said, Barbara, love is creative. We need to become creative here. So we accepted Eddie without having room here. I remember the guards coming to take me, get me, shackle me with my feet, shackle me with my hands. And we drove down to the local court courthouse and go in there, divorce didn't take, it didn't take five minutes. Put me back in the van, drive me back to the unit, goes to my unit, lay down. It's funny that I felt a relief. I finally did something. I don't not to make her happy, but I finally, I finally did something that she asked me to do. So I did 20 years in prison. So now I get released from prison and all these things that I told the Lord I was going to do on my part, I had to do, I had to practice. I had to do it in no other way about it. This is the only life. My wife already had a church waiting on me and, and they embraced me. All together, overall, I spent maybe around 10 years, around 10 to 12 years in jail. I got out of jail and I kept my word. I came back to Pacific Guard Mission and joined the Bible program. A lot of people, when you see people go to a homeless shelter, which is not a homeless shelter, Pacific Guard Mission is a gospel rescue mission, is what it is. Um, what brought me back there, it was God's love, it was God's grace, it was God's mercy, but it was also God's belt. I found out that somebody was there um, giving their testimony who happened to be Nelson Vargas being the father of the man that I killed. And Neftali went and he set up a meeting where we met at Midwest uh, Church with Pastor David and um, him and his family met me and my wife. We asked the Lord that what he's spoken over your life, that that will manifest for this time in the name of Jesus. And give him all the glory and all the honor. And I accept your apology. And I love you. Thank you. I'm here for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> He forgave me, you know, and this is something that was in my heart for the last 10 years in prison. I was forgiven by the father of the man who I killed. If that's not amazing. And so after uh, about 13 years, I remember one day mail call came and I got a letter in the mail and I opened it and it was from the parole board. And there was a date saying that they were going to interview me. And I was thought like, wow, this is weird. Like. I got this big, huge sentence, like, what's the parole board want to interview me for? Uh, the guy, the only guy talking, he said, you know, after looking at your file, it seems like uh, you're really not that bad a guy. And I was kind of like, nod my head, yes. And I said, yeah, you know, yes, sir. Go back to prison life as I know it. And I guess like the six week mark came up and uh, I was waiting to go to a meeting uh, for the workers for Set Free Ministry and all of a sudden on the loudspeaker they just called a whole bunch of names and mine was one of them. I go to the guy and he, he reads from a piece of paper my name and my number and then he um, proceeds to say that my release is scheduled um, in two and a half years. Two and a half years came and they just released me. Just like that. There's so many different things that I learned 
from the experience of being in the Cornelia House um, really has helped me become the man that I am today. We saw Eddie grow and grow and shine and shine. And he was a member of a local church here, First Baptist Church of Wheaton. And they adapted him big time. And then after he moved out of here, he was able to get a job there. Actually, before that, as a custodian, you know. And he even moved in the little white house there. And then, with all of that, his wife and he reconciled. So I had the blessing of seeing how they got engaged again. And I was able to do the wedding. That was an amazing day. I was due to get out of that prison about a year and a half, and I had nowhere to go. So I started writing all these, inst all these institutions that was available at that time, all these ministries rather, that was available that was supposed to help you when you got out. This man named Manny Mill wrote me, and he began to tell me that uh, we thank you for your interest in the ministry. We are a young ministry and we, we love to help men who are being released from prison trying to help you stay out. And he said, we, I'd like to come and visit you if I can. I was like, wow, okay, that's good. And we met at East Moline Prison in East Moline, Illinois. And there was Leslie, newly converted to Jesus full of vigor and passion. We were in that visiting room and we had that visiting room fired up with the, with the Lord. He was talking to me about Jesus. I was talking to him about the Lord and my conversion and he was so excited. I was able to teach him and to disciple him. He did well. He graduated from the ministry, from the house. And that was back in 92. That was almost 24, now 25 years ago. Believe it deep inside of me, I wanted somebody to stop and, and talk to me and tell me the right way to go. I wanted a father to, to be able to discipline me and say, look, this is the wrong way to go. I wanted, I desired to have a father who, 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 who would tell me that what I did was wrong. You know, as I think back, course um, of the 43 years of my life man uh, it's been a journey to say the least desiring to get that acceptance for my father and then that being just kind of taken away from me all of a sudden and the, then me trying to mask the hurt mask the pain um, by abusing substances and trying to really be somebody who I really wasn't to then finding myself in prison um, and being brought down to my knees to really see my depravity, to understand and see how precious life is. Because up until that point, I really didn't understand how precious life was. A father that would set me on his lap and tell me that school was the right thing for me to do. To go to school. To encourage me. To encourage me go to school, to be something. To then being released unexpectedly and God just continuing to shower me with his love and me at some point in time thinking, God, why? You know, why do you continue to love me? Why do you continue to just bless me the way you are? Like getting out of prison was enough, you know? But then after uh, four or five years of being out, you took me off parole when I wasn't supposed to get off for another like 80 years. And then to, to give me a wife, somebody to be there for me, to help me learn how to even live in life, not having a job before, not never paying bills before, not knowing how to budget and learning a lot of those things, but never putting them into practice and being tempted in so many areas, but have somebody that will have my back and be there with me every step of the way. But let me tell you, when God came into my life, 
I begin to read and study about God being a father and what he desired for me. God became my father. He began to instill values in me through his word, through the word of God. I began to learn the values of life, the values of living, the values of loving. Because if you ask me, I didn't even love myself. Then for you to provide a job for me that, that I could learn and grow and establish relationships with do I have a being and then another job ultimately to be uh, proclaiming the gospel, the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, which I feel that, that you were building me up, that you were cultivating his life in me all for that moment for me to step into ministry for you, not myself. And then just continuing to open the door of your heart to me. Like why? Despite all the things I had done and God was telling me in his word, he loved me. He loved me regardless of that. Do you, do you know how much that really, really touched me and changed me? Unless we can get the church to reconstruct the mom and the dad that they never had and really believe the gospel, which part of it is adoption, and begin to adopt these men and this woman in our churches and recreate for them what they never had, which was a, a healthy family. I think we're gonna keep seeing this. We're gonna keep this repeating itself uh, of seeing eight, 900 people killed every year in Chicago, Cleveland, Philadelphia, New York, New Orleans, Los Angeles. I mean, you're gonna see it. The solution is always the church. And therefore, we need to get to know the one who paid for the church, who made the church happen. His name is Jesus Christ. And if we get to know him, we can get to know his, his, his father. And if we can introduce this man and this woman to the father, then we're going to see a change. Are we seeing that in the prisons? People are now embracing me, and now what I want to do is show people getting out, prepare the way for them so they can have a church. Because people will be coming home from prison, and what better place to be accepted and embraced than the church? Today, now I'm involved in Corner Near House National Ministries. I'm on the support team for the uh, inmates that are getting out of prison. When I see young men who come through our ministry, the Corner New House National Ministry, they don't have fathers. They, had, they didn't have fathers who were instilling values in their life. They didn't have fathers. So now what I do, I became their father. You see my sculptors in the background? My talent, I continued it. I continued it even on the outside. And believe me, you, it's profitable unto me. It's profitable. And God doesn't expect for me to bury the talent like the wicked servant. He buried his talent. God said, don't bury that. I gave you that talent to profit from and to show the world my glory. And, and now the world looks at my talent and they say, wow, you made that? You, you did that? That's amazing. There's so many men in the prisons that's fathers that has kids out here, I mean, and, it, and, it's, and, it, and it's so sad. It's so sad because what end up happening is, you know, without, without having a father out here to teach them, to guide them, to lead them, to direct them, what do we think gonna happen? They're gonna end up going down the same road as their father did. So I try to teach them or talk to them and, and, and challenge them that you know, these are the things that you must do if you don't want to see your kids, you know, back, uh, come to this same place where you at. Because a lot of you guys are going to get out. And the question is, what are you going to do?
Start asking yourself, are there any gaps or holes in my heart? What are my desires? What is my purpose here on this earth even? If you really start asking those questions and you really start seeking God, God will begin revealing himself to you. Place your faith and trust in Christ. He won't fail you. He will mend all your wounds. He'll fix that broken heart that you have and he'll give you everything that you need. And sometimes, not just sometimes, a lot of times, he'll even give you things that you want because he's a good, good father. I would tell him about Jesus Christ. I would tell him about God, that this is a father that really, really, really love you. You cannot change your ancestors but you can change your descendants. You cannot change what happened in your past, um, but you can change what happens in your future. And you can be the individual that breaks the cycle of fatherless homes uh, in your family, in your community. You can be the individual who decides to set a different example, plot a different course, as difficult as that might be. And to do that, you are going to need mentors. You are going to need role models. And let me uh, encourage you to seek out a uh, local church that uh, preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, where you can find available role models, deacons, elders, pastors, missionaries, apostles, others, who can provide you with the attention and time uh, to help you discover your way to manhood, to help confer upon you the gift of masculinity. I advise you to stay away from the gangs. And I know that that's easy for me to say. Let me now introduce you to God the Father. God says he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will provide for you if you seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. He promised that he will not leave you homeless or fatherless. So turn away, turn around, go to a pastor. There are plenty of good people that you can go to in the church. Seek help, pray to God the Father. He's not going to abandon you, he's going to protect you. God has always been that father that, that I never really, really knew. Only 17 when my dad passed away Needed him to come and somehow rescue me Gone too far, I was way too high Drunk out my mind on the day that he died Thinking of myself and I never said goodbye Took another hit like the birds I could fly Showed no emotion, just held it all in Deeper and deeper I sunk into my sin no way out as far as I could see Cried out, God, please rescue me Son, take your time and know I'm right here Step by step, we're gonna face your fear Listen real close as I tell you what to do And if you fall, son, I'ma catch you Made it safe into my father's arms His love rescued me when I'd gone too far